Thanks to the talented folks over at Microsoft, as well as collaboration of various other teams, Xbox Series gamers and also Windows-based PC gamers will soon be enjoying improved visuals as well as better performance. Variable rate shading, a variable rate compute shading, has had many advancements since the Xbox series of consoles were first introduced and since DirectX 12 Ultimate as a standard was created. And as you probably guessed in this very video, we're going to be going over those advancements as well as just tackling the very basics of what actually variable rate shading, variable rate compute shading are. Now, I want to stress that this is for the basics. So if you're a developer, this is not going to be necessarily a video for you. However, if you just want the ins and outs of how it works and understanding why it's going to improve your games, then, well, this is going to be the video for you. Now, let's start out, though, with a slightly different topic, because I think it's important for us to get some context on exactly what variable rate shading is and what it's not. There has been a lot of discussion for multiple console generations now, of course, as what the native resolution of a game is. And increasingly, we're seeing games developers adopting a different philosophy, i.e. upsampling from a lower resolution to a higher resolution. Microsoft, Sony, NVIDIA, Intel, AMD and Epic, plus many other talented folks across different studios, are all researching different versions of upsampling. The basic goal of their research is similar, draw, render if you will, a game in a lower resolution, and then use fancy jiggery pokery to create a higher resolution output. For example, a 1440p image could be upscaled to 4K. I don't want to focus too much of the video discussing this, as I have plenty of other content specifically focused on this very topic, but I think it's very important for us to briefly go over this so we can put VRS into better context. Imagine, if you will, that the more pixels there are to draw on screen, the more work that the console or PC graphics card needs to do. A native 1440p image is around 3.7 million pixels compared to around 8.3 million of a native 4K output. Therefore, rendering the game at that 3.7 million target, and then using some method or another to create a high resolution output, it's clearly tantalizing. So how much of a difference does this make on performance of a game? Well, let's take a look at a few benchmarks using a mixture of NVIDIA's DLSS technology and a bit of a surprise. I want to thank MSI for providing us with the excellent MAG Z690 Torpedo DDR5 motherboard for our testing. It's been rock stable so far and we'll be using it for a couple of very interesting comparisons, so sub if you're interested in PC hardware technology. The board features support for 6400 MHz plus DDR5 memory, a Duet 16 phase VRM solution with heat sinks of course, an M.2 shield frozer to help keep the next generation PCIe NVMe drives running cooler and of course at higher performance, as well as beefy set of I.O. both internal and external with reinforced PCIe 5 slots to provide extra support for the GPU and higher quality audio capacitors. I'd also like to thank Corsair for sending over their Fury X memory and an RM850X power supply to help make this video possible. The RM850 watt is a great modular power supply with rock stable power delivery and the 32 gigabyte Fury X 5200 MTS DDR5 memory kit can be seriously tweaked with tighter timings. There's also a DDR4 version of the board which will be pitting against the DDR5 brother here for some cool comparisons. So again, definitely sub, it'll be interesting. As you can clearly see though, the lower the input resolution, the higher the performance. Makes sense, right? And generally, the lower the visual quality, the different solutions such as NVIDIA's DLSS handles things better than say FSR. This is particularly true when you're getting to lower resolutions like 1080p. I suspect this will change considerably though when AMD finally releases FSR 2.0, which uses very different underlying technology. Actually, it's more similar, FSR 2.0 that is, to TSR. And we've already got a preview of this. UE5 was supposed to be the debut of the new image reconstruction technology from Epic, but we actually see it here in Ghostwire Tokyo. It's a UE4 game, Ghostwire that is, so the code has essentially been backported to this earlier engine. It does a pretty good job too, although I don't think it quite matches the standards of DLSS in finer details. I'll leave you to 
discuss that in the comments though because it falls slightly outside the topic of this video as it's VRS. And why on earth have we been discussing image reconstruction so long? I mean, yeah, well, really, the elevator pitch for variable rate shading, VRS, could be something like, what if, rather than rendering the whole scene in a lower resolution, and then attempt to recreate the scene in a higher resolution, but instead, we draw the scene, but vary and lower the quality in less important bits to give more performance. Now, this is not the same thing as increasing pixel count, by reconstructing the image from a lower resolution, from say 1080p to 1440p. Instead, it takes the opposite approach, allowing you to specify a resolution to run a pixel shader on. We'll discuss this more in a second and explain it, don't worry. And the Xbox or PC graphics card can basically vary this detail across the whole screen based upon different regions. Oh, and to head the question off at the pass, yes, VRS can work alongside reconstruction technology too. So lower quality seems bad on the surface, right? Well, in truth, no, because some regions of the screen are just simply less important than others, either because details are out of focus or blurred, caked in blown out highlights or other criteria which developers can set forth better than surely to focus the processing horsepower on areas which do impact visual quality. We'll go further into specifics and examples later, but a really simple and good starting example is that your eye perceives details differently in areas of high uh, color and lightness. For example, if an area is hit by tons of direct light and pushes heavily into HDR brightness values, something that Microsoft's teams have worked extensively on over the past year, we'll get more into that in a moment, shading rates can be reduced. So think about when you go outside on a really sunny day and the bright light hits a surface and washes out some of the detail, say on a pavement or on a mirrored surface or whatever. I admit if you're British, you may have to really scratch your head on this one. It might be a little trickier to think of examples, what with our summers. But similarly though, there are tons of other scenarios which can be accounted for too. And again, I know I've said this a couple of times at this point, we'll get to that. VRS though is another tool to provide developers fine-grained abilities to squeeze more performance out of their games. This is, of course, even more important in a console which has fixed hardware capabilities. So if something contributes less to the presentation, its shading rate, i.e. the quality of the specific region in the screen, can be lower. In turn, this saves performance and either bolsters other areas with extra detail or fancy lighting effects, or you can produce a more stable frame rate, or go with a higher overall resolution. Remember that common game frame rates for consoles are 30, 60, or 120 FPS. On PC, they can go even higher, 165, 240 hertz, and so on and so on. Ultimately, though, what's really happening, simplified, is that the GPU is quite literally drawing, say, 60 unique images per second. The higher the rate of speed that these images are shown, higher the frame rate, in other words, the less time the system has to create each image. So, to maintain a lock to 120Hz, for example, the GPU must spit out a new frame every 8.33 milliseconds. This time it doubles to 16.67 to maintain 60Hz. Simple enough then. So you need to draw a new frame with an average of 8.33 milliseconds for 120Hz. Well, kind of. I don't really want to get super into the complexities too much anyway of things like frame pacing. And to be fair, if you're running an Xbox Series console or a PC, and eventually the PlayStation 5 when Sony releases the update on a variable refresh rate TV or monitor, it's less of an issue. But uneven frame pacing, where, say, frame 1 could be 7.4 milliseconds, the next 9, the next 8.3, then 7.8, 9 milliseconds, and so on. It can produce unsightly results, especially at lower frame rates, for example 30 FPS, when input latencies tend to vary. And you're just swearing that you dodge that attack or press the jump button, despite the fact that your character is currently plummeting down the ravine. 
Thus, techniques to reduce and balance GPU workloads are extremely important. But I hear you say, okay, higher frame rates make sense. The tricks developers often use to keep frame rates up are dynamic resolutions, of course. Dropping the internal rendered resolution when stuff gets busy in an effort to maintain smooth gameplay. So just to quickly recap, because VRS impacts portions of the image, which aren't as important, you won't really perceive the drop in image quality. It's hard to notice lower details as a demon off screen shoots you with a flamethrower, while another is attempting to part you with your arm in Doom Eternal. But the performance saving from VRS, or rather the game engine, allows the game to average at higher resolutions. Thus you get better overall visuals and also a more stable frame rate. So what kind of performance savings can developers win with VRS on consoles, and what of the PC, assuming you own a graphics card and a game which support them? Well, again, this does depend on the console and the target resolution. The average win for the Xbox Series X from Microsoft's own internal numbers is around 10 to 15%. This is not trivial, it's not small. But due to the Series S, Lockhart, running titles at lower resolutions, compared to its bigger brother anyway, performance gains are still appreciable, but less impactful. The Series S starts to really shine when higher quality modes, or more accurately, modes which run in higher resolutions, are used. Settings this way give VRS more pixels to work with compared to the performance or lower resolution modes. So if a title has VRS support on the Xbox Series S and you get the option to run it in a high quality mode, VRS is more likely putting in more work per frame because, again, it has more pixels. For example, 4K versus 1440p. This also somewhat applies to the Series X as well, but because it has a considerably more powerful GPU to start with, games just run at a high resolution by default. I do want to get just briefly into the history of VRS, because the concept of variable rate shading isn't exactly new, far from it. Mainstream hardware support for VRS came with NVIDIA's Turing architecture. This is RTX 20 and launched back in September 2018. And there were even games which kind of supported it, with Wolfenstein 2 receiving an update and Youngblood, which was its kind of sequel, which launched in 2019. Now, these did have a VRS option, but again, I want to use the term kind of, because how did NVIDIA, as well as developers, achieve this? DirectX 12 Ultimate wasn't actually released at this point. Well, quite simply, they were using another graphics API, Vulkan, and NVIDIA's own API extensions. Games such as Youngblood actually had VRS supported, although at this point it wasn't VRS. Again, it was NVIDIA's own tech, and it was called NVIDIA Adaptive Shading, or NAS if you prefer. It used slightly different techniques to Microsoft's VRS as you can see on screen, but for all intents and purposes, if targeting a DirectX 12 platform on such as Windows, a developer now would, of course, use Microsoft's implementation. But if you're using a different operating system and you want to use Vulkan, then that's a slightly different topic. So this technology actually still uses the same hardware on the GPU, that is NVIDIA's NAS, but again, it doesn't use DirectX. It's worth noting, though, that at this time, NVIDIA were pushing a ton of their own technology, including ray tracing, known as RTX, and even mesh shaders. So yeah, uh, ray tracing from NVIDIA, we saw games, of course, running with ray tracing enabled before DirectX 12 Ultimate. Unfortunately, there weren't any mesh shading games, at least to my knowledge, that used NVIDIA's uh, extensions. I think the only thing that we actually saw was the Asteroids demo, which was available around Turing's launch. I have to say that Asteroids was really impressive. I actually interviewed uh, NVIDIA back around the launch, I think, of Turing, if memory serves, uh, discussing Asteroids quite extensively. 
And of course, a lot of this stuff ended up being fully supported with DirectX 12 Ultimate because DirectX 12 is an API Microsoft uses as a common language. It's basically a feature set which is shared between the Xbox series of consoles as well as Windows PC. This allows easier porting of code and optimization between the two platforms. So to this end, Microsoft have included support for variable rate shading. So that was a really big history lesson, but how does tier two VRS differ from tier one? And what actually is this update all about? In brief summary, VRS two has much the same goal as the earlier VRS tier one, if you will, but there is a significant difference and that's granularity. Microsoft's teams actually first discussed tier two back in January, 2021, as they implemented the technology into gears five. In essence, tier one allows a developer to specify a shading rate per draw call, whereas tier two uses a screen space texture. Basically, the previous frame of animation generates a version of the scene. You can see here in Gears Tactics implementation, comparing tier one and two. And this means that the colored regions based on criteria, we'll get more into this in a moment, I promise, can be shaded at coarser, AKA lower quality rates. In essence, just think of tier one as having a lower hardware requirement. So say Intel's iGPUs would support only tier one and not tier two, which modern Nvidia cards and AMD cards, and for those of you wondering, yes, of course, the Xbox supports tier two. So think of tier two then really as like a fine scalpel, providing better savings and tighter controls for developers. But how does this magical technology work? Well, like everything in the video, I'm going to be simplifying this significantly due to the complexity of the topic. But again, I'm going to thank NVIDIA for this rather nice image to show off VRS. The scene here is covered by a bunch of different colored squares, and you can spot the handy dandy guy to the left. You can see the numbers such as one by one, two by two, attributed to those colors. For cheering, I'll be discussing Xbox examples further in a moment, the screen basically can have 16 by 16 uh, regions of the screen adjusted, having different rates, so 16 by 16 pixels. Or, if you will, different bits of the screen can have variable rates of shading. You see what I did there? For example, the car and foliage, which is a wash with fine detail, are shaded in full rates. So it was basically like VRS is never ever applied. Just native image, essentially. But notice the road in green. It's a two by two shading rate. This means that one shading result is being used to color four pixels, basically a square. There's also non-square shading rates too, such as one by two or two by four. This is used to best match the bit of the screen or region being shaded. To simplify this explanation further still, one by one is default, no VRS, full quality pixels. And then say two by two is half resolution shading rates. In this original implementation described in GameStack 2021 April, we see the pipeline of this frame N, that's the previous frame, to be used as the final color buffer. Basically think of the color buffer as kind of like the color image of the frame. The developers then use edge detection on the image and then the image is rescaled based upon dynamic resolution. So for example, if the next frame of animation is a higher resolution or lower resolution compared to the previous frame, then obviously it can adjust things. Obviously this would not be as extreme as this, but let's say frame one was at 1080p and then frame two was 1440p because of dynamic resolution, it could, you know, scale things. But in reality, you know, dynamic resolution scaling wouldn't almost certainly be that big of a difference, but you can help to visualize it. So if we take a peek at the VRS update from Microsoft, there's a nice example from Gears 5. Marcus is standing in the ruins and again, developers represent the various VRS shading rates as color blocks. Finer rates of shading in red, such as the trees and plant life and other details, 
And for water, well, a coarser shading rate of 2.2 is more common, reducing the details as required, because, for example, water reflections, they don't need to be in such glorious detail. This brings us back to how our eyes perceive details, and some of the newer discoveries when it comes to HDR, or high dynamic range, as Microsoft Teams have done extensive work in this area. The subject here is very deep, but basically speaking, the image is processed for output on your TV, where, for example, it might be upsampled, and we need to do it prior to this. A tone map curve is run on the image, therefore. There's a plethora of methods to achieve this, tons, tons of different calculations and curves that they could use. This includes Reinhardt Luma, Square Root Luma, and all have their own positives and drawbacks. According to both Martin Fuller and the folks over at ID, the best so far seems to be Reinhardt Luma 2, uh, 2X. So then, based upon the lighting of a scene, along with a plethora of other things, such as if it's being affected by depth of field, motion blurs, which, of course, destroy fine details, you are, or more accurately, developers are, able to adjust shading rates for areas partially obscured by even the HUD. You, or more accurately, developers can also adjust shading rates for areas partially obscured by the HUD, such as a life bar, or in, say, transparent reflections or other such um, criteria. To echo what I've already said, there's a lot of, in this VRS coverage that I'm simply missing because the complex nuts and bolts stuff in this talk just fall outside the coverage most people would be interested in, though I will provide full links to the presentation. Before we go into the compute shaders, though, there are a few other things I want to touch on, and one of those is the Alpha Point demo. This is created using the newfangled Unreal Engine 5. At this point, Unreal Engine is synonymous with game development, and UE5 is still not technically released. It's available in betas right now. You can actually download it yourself if you have a good enough equipped PC. The improvements, though, over UE4 are tantalizing. The biggest improvement, perhaps, are both Nanite and Lumen, and definitely they've received the most press. The latter is a highly advanced lighting system, and I have covered this in depth previously, and as for Nanite, it's a new geometry pipeline. I've discussed Nanite in a dedicated video before, and I've also discussed both with Intel Graphics, Bob Duffy, and Roblox, and former PlayStation guy, Matt Hargett. In a nutshell, though, Nanite allows developers to import ultra-high quality models from, say, Blender or ZBrush, and the detail of polygon meshes essentially adjusts on the fly based upon your or rather the camera's uh, distance or proximity to these models. It also completely has the ability to redefine the graphics pipeline as a whole as well. Nanite basically takes the traditional graphics pipeline throwing out the window and leverages compute commands much more in line with how a GPU actually functions under the hood. Sony's PlayStation 5 geometry engine is essentially designed to really push the hardware capabilities of Nanai. Actually, Sony seems to have had a big hand in UE5, as well as AMD and NVIDIA. And Microsoft, too, has a lot of tricks when it comes to performance savings. When Microsoft were first experimenting with VRS Tier 2 a year ago, they not began to port their works and efforts to UE5 as well as Nanite. So how has the team done? Well, Microsoft's VRS implementation, or more accurately, the port of VRS that we see from Gears 5 and ported that to UE5, doesn't actually run using Nanite rasterization because the compute shader and UAV atomics, according to the coalition, they just would not be able to make VRS compatible here. So instead, it runs on the emit G buffers pass. For this particular pass, we see around a 33% speed up, going from about 1.1 milliseconds to 7.3. Again, I want to stress that UE5 has not seen a full release yet, so Microsoft, Sony, and just about everyone has a ton of optimization still left on the table, I'm pretty certain. Really and truly, UE5 is basically designed to take full advantage of these next generation consoles. And quite frankly, you know, we have faster CPUs, SSDs, and much more. 
Lastly, let's have a look at Doom Eternal, which recently enjoyed a patch for the 9th gen consoles. The Xbox Series X and S, Scarlet and Lockhart respectively in these graphs, both have different resolution and frame rate targets, depending on what visual settings the player chooses. For example, performance mode runs at an internal resolution of 1800p and up to 120fps. Ray tracing mode maintains the same resolution on Series X but halves the frame rate targets to just 60, so of course each frame has twice as long to be drawn. Generally, the game maintains a target resolution, but when things get really hectic, dynamic resolution scaling kicks in and attempts to maintain the target frame rate. Essentially, if the game notices a frame is taking too long to render, it'll reduce the resolution for frame pacing and frame rate consistency. According to the team, VRS here helps save, in heavier scenes, around 5-10% to of performance by lowering details appropriately such as when the flamethrowers here are shaded at lower rate because they're so bright they just obscure the finer details in the flames. In best case scenarios for VRS, or to put it another way, in areas which are the worst case for frame rate and lend themselves well to VRS tier 2, we see up to a 25% improvement in performance. With the previous generation of consoles, um, Compute shaders and asynchronous compute were becoming quite well known, and in essence, a GPU is a highly parallel device, with thousands of shaders capable of executing an instruction super, super quickly, because in essence, you can imagine them as very simple CPUs. Tons of CPU cores, of course, can run an application very quickly, and in one sense, that's kind of what's happening with a GPU. Tasks can be calculated very quickly by simply splitting the work across thousands of different GPU cores, therefore you can have absolutely massive amounts of computational power. Taking the Xbox Series X as an example, it features a GPU based on AMD's graphics IP. There are 26 worker groups, each of which house two compute units each. This means there are 52 compute units active out of 56 compute units present on the die. There are four disabled basically for yield purposes. Each of these compute units, in turn, sport 64 cores, and they can run various compute instructions. The graphics pipeline itself is quite outside the scope of this video to really dive deeply into, but in a nutshell, you can think of a compute shader as asking the GPU to process something that's not related to the tr traditional graphics pipeline. So the GPU compute could run other tasks, such as AI, image reconstruction, physics, lighting, and so on and so on. This compute work is then ran on the GPU as these cores become available, essentially asynchronously along with graphics workloads. Although stuff like Nanite really transforms this, the older traditional rendering pipeline basically is not used, and instead things are a lot more along the lines of compute focus. I've discussed this more in previous videos, and also discussions on mesh shaders and also other things as well, but basically speaking, it's pretty complicated, but I did want to touch on it briefly here, because we're going to be looking at this from the perspective of the traditional um, graphics pipeline and not something like Nanoid. Switching context, haha, <laughs> tech joke, to lighting and compute though, there are two types of lighting models. The first is forward rendering and the second is deferred, well, at least which are applicable here. I've linked a nice article which delves into this subject much deeper, but you can see on screen the comparison between the two in these images. Boiled down to its basics, with deferred lighting, geometry is processed first, and then lighting is calculated in a separate pass. So this brings us to the motives of VRCS. As you can see in the slide, almost at the beginning of the presentation from Microsoft, for titles with deferred lighting, VRS doesn't improve performance. So what's the solution? Well, you probably figured that all out already. It's a nice comparison here for the performance savings of both VRS and VR. CS running on a Series X console with a target resolution of 4K. Notice there are several columns and rows here, with VRS 
off and sparse lighting, which is what Martin Fuller, the holder of the talk, is calling variable rate deferred lighting running on compute shaders. You can see why he came up with a different name, can't you? It's pretty obvious though, a ground truth image with basically everything being rendered without any tricks and fancy methods to improve performance. Basically, every pixel is shaded and lit. It's just really obvious how much of a difference there is in performance. It's huge. The total reduction in execution time is 51%, as you can see in the savings column to the right, with sparse lighting and VRS. Now, I want to be really clear that this is only at certain elements within the scene. This is not the entire rendered frame. So, for example, you're not going to see a, a frame rates improved by 50%. There's a ton of other stuff which is happening in the generation of an image, but even so, this is an absolutely huge saving. It's a massive win in performance. In the follow-up slide, we actually see what happens with a Series S. Despite a more modest 1440p resolution, the performance is bolstered significantly, thanks again to sparse lighting and VRS. It's worth also considering that the time of day such as, say, the lighting and mood of the scene, can impact performance too. The reason behind this is that shadows, for example, get longer, and lighting calculations can become more expensive depending on tons of different conditions. Compare the horizontal sun to the low sun here for ground truth, and you can see you're looking at a gigantic amount of additional rendering time in this test scene. So this is actually where sparse lighting along with VRS come in because this all works on shading rates. Basically, because more scene becomes lit in shadows or to put it another way, darker regions fill the screen, shading rates can get coarser because again, you could see less details within those shadows and the objects which are covering the shadows. So they can become less detailed and all of this has clear Obvious ramifications on performance with larger savings on harder to light scenes means that effects are basically less expensive for developers to implement. With any luck, you have a better understanding now as to what variable rate shading and variable rate compute shaders actually are and how they will be influential in games to come. Of course, these are just tools in a developer's toolkit and they may not be necessarily particularly applicable to a specific game or a project. Furthermore, as we've discussed in this video, variable rate shading will also be very much platform dependent as well. Ultimately, there are going to be a ton of advancements over the coming years. UE5 has now officially been launched, and obviously it's been met with excellent reception. UE5, I think, is going to really change how games are designed, and quite frankly, it's an extremely powerful engine. Sure, it does have competitors, that is UE5, but I think at this point, Unreal Engine has become synonymous with game development. And with awesome things like Lumen and Nanite, as we've discussed in the video, you can start to imagine how we can have some absolutely amazing visuals in games to come. And it's going to be absolutely fascinating to see what, say, Gear 6 would look like. Again, if you would like more information about UE5 from a developer's perspective, you should check out the podcast with Intel's of Bob Duffy and also Matt Hargett, because I think it's pretty fascinating. They know absolutely a ton about the subject. You can uh, find it on the channel by just searching Red Gaming Tech Bob Duffy or Matt Hargett, and it will pop up. With that said though, hopefully you have enjoyed the video. If you did, then of course leave a likey on the video because it helps us out a ton. And if you're not a subscriber, well, it's YouTube, you know what to do. With that said, take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.